Beginner's Mind People say that practicing Zen is difficult, but there's a misunderstanding as to why. It's not difficult because it is hard to sit in the cross-legged position or to attain enlightenment. It is difficult because it is hard to keep our mind pure and our practice pure in its fundamental sense. The Zen school developed in many ways after it was established in China, but at the same time it became more and more impure. But I do not want to talk about Chinese Zen or the history of Zen. I'm interested in helping you keep your practice from becoming impure. In Japan we have the phrase Shoshin, which means beginner's mind. The goal of practice is always to keep our beginner's mind. Suppose you recite the Prajna Paramita Sutra only once. It might be a very good recitation. But what would happen to you if you recited it twice, three times, four times or more? You might easily lose your original attitude towards it. The same thing will happen in your other Zen practices. For a while you will keep your beginner's mind. But if you continue to practice one, two, three years or more, Although you may improve some, you are liable to lose the limitless meaning of original mind. For Zen students, the most important thing is not to be dualistic. Our original mind includes everything within itself. It is always rich and sufficient within itself. You should not lose your self-sufficient state of mind. This does not mean a closed mind, but actually an empty mind and a ready mind. If your mind is empty, it is always ready for anything. It is open to everything. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. If you discriminate too much, you limit yourself. If you are too demanding or too greedy, your mind is not rich and self-sufficient. If we lose our original self-sufficient mind, we will lose all precepts. When your mind becomes demanding, when you long for something, you will end up violating your own precepts, not to tell lies, not to steal, not to kill, not to be immoral, and so forth. But once you start to do it, you have none. Your effort appeases your inmost desire. There is no other way to attain calmness. Calmness of mind does not mean you should stop your activity. Real calmness should be found in activity itself. We say it is easy to have calmness in inactivity. It is hard to have calmness in activity. But calmness in activity is true calmness. After you have practiced for a while, you will realize that it is not possible to make rapid, extraordinary progress. Even though you try very hard, the progress you make is always little by little. It is not like going out in a shower in which you know when you get wet. In a fog, you do not know you are getting wet. But as you keep walking, you get wet little by little. If your mind has ideas of progress, you may say, Oh, this pace is terrible. But actually, it is not. When you get wet in a fog, it is very difficult to dry yourself. So there is no need to worry about progress. It is like studying a foreign language. You cannot do it all of a sudden, but by repeating it over and over, you will master it. This is the Soto way of practice. We can say, either that we make progress little by little or that we do not even expect to make progress. Just to be sincere and make our full effort in each moment is enough. There is no nirvana outside our practice. Nothing special. I do not feel like speaking after Zazen. I feel the practice of Zazen is enough. But if I must say something, I think I would like to talk about how wonderful it is to practice Zazen. Our purpose is just to keep this practice forever. This practice started from beginningless time and it will continue into an endless future. Strictly speaking, 
For a human being, there is no other practice than this practice. There is no other way of life than this way of life. Zen practice is the direct expression of our true nature. Of course, whatever we do is the expression of our true nature. But without this practice, it is difficult to realize. It is our human nature to be active, and the nature of every existence. As long as we are alive, we are always doing something. But as long as you think, I am doing this, or I have to do this, or I must attain something special, you are actually not doing anything. When you give up, when you no longer want something, or when you do not try to do anything special, then you do something. When there is no gaining idea in what you do, then you do something. In Zazen, what you are doing is not for the sake of anything. You may feel as if you were doing something special, but actually it is only the expression of your true nature. It is the activity which appeases your inmost desire. But as long as you think you are practicing Zazen for the sake of something, that is not true practice. If you continue this simple practice every day, you will obtain a wonderful power. Before you attain it, it is something wonderful. But after you obtain it, it is nothing special. It is just you, yourself, nothing special. As a Chinese poem says, I went and I returned. It was nothing special. Rosan, famous for its misty mountains, Seco for its water. People think it must be wonderful to see the famous range of mountains covered by mists and the water said to cover all the earth. But if you go there, you will just see water and mountains, nothing special. It is a kind of mystery that for people who have no experience of enlightenment, enlightenment is something wonderful. But if they attain it, it is nothing. But yet it is not nothing. Do you understand? For a mother with children, having children is nothing special. That is Zazen. So if you continue this practice, more and more you will acquire something. Nothing special, but nevertheless something. You may say universal nature, or Buddha nature, or enlightenment. You may call it by many names, but for the person who has it, it is nothing, and it is something. When we express our true nature, we are human beings. When we do not, we do not know what we are. We are not an animal because we walk on two legs. We are something different from an animal, but what are we? We may be a ghost. We do not know what to call ourselves. Such a creature does not actually exist. It is a delusion. We are not a human being anymore, but we do exist. When Zen is not Zen, nothing exists. Intellectually, my talk makes no sense, but if you have experienced true practice, you will understand what I mean. If something exists, it has its own true nature, its Buddha nature. In the Pari Nirvana Sutra, Buddha says, everything has Buddha nature. But Dogen reads it in this way, Everything is Buddha nature. There is a difference. If you say everything has Buddha nature, it means Buddha nature is in each existence. So Buddha nature and each existence are different. But when you say everything is Buddha nature, it means everything is Buddha nature itself. When there is no Buddha nature, there is nothing at all. Something apart from Buddha nature is just a delusion. It may exist in your mind, but such things actually do not exist. So, to be a human being is to be a Buddha. Buddha nature is just another name for human nature, our true human nature. Thus, even though you do not do anything, you are actually doing something. You are expressing yourself. You are expressing your true nature. Your eyes will express, your voice will express, your demeanor will express. 
the most important thing is to express your true nature in the simplest, most adequate way and to appreciate it in the smallest existence. While you are continuing this practice, week after week, year after year, your experience will become deeper and deeper, and your experience will cover everything you do in your everyday life. The most important thing is to forget all gaining ideas, all dualistic ideas. In other words, just practice Zazen in a certain posture. Do not think about anything. Just remain on your cushion without expecting anything. Then, eventually, you will resume your own true nature. That is to say, your own true nature resumes itself. The reason everything looks beautiful is because it is out of balance. But its background is always in perfect harmony. This is how everything exists in the realm of Buddha nature losing its balance against a background of perfect balance. So if you see things without realizing the background of Buddha nature, everything appears to be in the form of suffering. But if you understand the background of existence, you realize that suffering itself is how we live and how we extend our life. So in Zen, sometimes we emphasize the imbalance or disorder of life. Nowadays, traditional Japanese painting has become pretty formal and lifeless. That is why modern art has developed. Ancient painters used to practice putting dots on paper in artistic disorder. This is rather difficult. Even though you try to do it, usually what you do is arranged in some order. You think you can control it, but you cannot. It is almost impossible to arrange your dots out of order. It is the same with taking care of your everyday life. Even though you try to put people under some control, it is impossible. You cannot do it. The best way to control people is to encourage them to be mischievous. Then they will be in control in its wider sense. To give your sheep or cow a large, spacious meadow is the way to control him. So it is with people. First let them do what they want and watch them. This is the best policy. To ignore them is not good. That is the worst policy. The second worst is trying to control them. The best one is to watch them. Just to watch them without trying to control them. The same way works for you yourself as well. If you want to obtain perfect calmness in your zazen, you should not be bothered by the various images you find in your mind. Let them come and let them go. Then they will be under control. But this policy is not so easy. It sounds easy, but it requires some special effort. How to make this kind of effort is the secret of practice. Suppose you are sitting under some extraordinary circumstances. If you try to calm your mind, you will be unable to sit. And if you try not to be disturbed, your effort will not be the right effort. The only effort that will help you is to count your breathing or to concentrate on your inhaling and exhaling. We say concentration but to concentrate your mind on something is not the true purpose of Zen. The true purpose is to see things as they are, to observe things as they are, and to let everything go as it goes. This is to put everything under control in its widest sense. Zen practice is to open up our small mind. So concentrating is just an aid to help you realize big mind or the mind that is everything. If you want to discover the true meaning of Zen in your everyday life, you have to understand the meaning of keeping your mind on your breathing and your body in the right posture in Zazen. You should follow the rules of practice and your study should become more subtle and careful. Only in this way can you experience the vital freedom of Zen. Dogen Zenji said, Time goes from present to past. 
This is absurd, but in our practice, sometimes it is true. Instead of time progressing from past to present, it goes backwards from present to past. Yoshitsune was a famous warrior who lived in medieval Japan. Because of the situation of the country at that time, he was sent to the northern provinces where he was killed. Before he left, he bade farewell to his wife, and soon after she wrote in a poem, Just as you unreel the thread from a spool, I want the past to become present. When she said this, actually she made past time present. In her mind, the past became alive and was the present. So as Dogen said, time goes from present to past. This is not true in our logical mind, but it is in the actual experience of making past time present. There we have poetry, and there we have human life. When we experience this kind of truth, it means we have found the true meaning of time. Time constantly goes from past to present and from present to future. This is true, but it is also true that time goes from future to present and from present to past. A Zen master once said, to go eastward one mile is to go westward one mile. This is vital freedom. We should acquire this kind of perfect freedom. But perfect freedom is not found without some rules. People, especially young people, think that freedom is to do just what they want, that in Zen there is no need for rules. But it is absolutely necessary for us to have some rules. But this does not mean always to be under control. As long as you have rules, you have a chance for freedom. To try to obtain freedom without being aware of the rules means nothing. It is to acquire this perfect freedom that we practice Sazen. Mind Weeds When the alarm rings early in the morning and you get up, I think you do not feel so good. It is not easy to go and sit. And even after you arrive at the Zendo and begin Zazen, you have to encourage yourself to sit well. These are just waves of your mind. In pure Zazen, there should not be any waves in your mind. While you are sitting, these waves will become smaller and smaller, and your effort will change into some subtle feeling. We say, pulling out the weeds, we give nourishment to the plant. We pull the weeds and bury them near the plant to give it nourishment. So even though you have some difficulty in your practice, even though you have some waves while you are sitting, those waves themselves will help you. So you should not be bothered by your mind. You should rather be grateful for the weeds, because eventually they will enrich your practice. If you have some experience of how the weeds in your mind change into mental nourishment, your practice will make remarkable progress. You will feel the progress. You will feel how they change into self-nourishment. Of course, it is not so difficult to give some philosophical or psychological interpretation of our practice, but that is not enough. We must have the actual experience of how our weeds change into nourishment. Suppose your children are suffering from a hopeless disease. You do not know what to do. You cannot lie in bed. Normally the most comfortable place for you would be a warm, comfortable bed. But now because of your mental agony you cannot rest. You may walk up and down, in and out, but this does not help. Actually, the best way to relieve your mental suffering is to sit in Zazen. Even in such a confused state of mind and bad posture. If you have no experience of sitting in this kind of difficult situation, you are not a Zen student. No other activity will appease your suffering. In other restless positions you have no power to accept your difficulties. But in the Zazen posture, 
which you have acquired by long, hard practice. Your body and mind have great power to accept things as they are, whether they are agreeable or disagreeable. When you feel disagreeable, it is better for you to sit. There is no other way to accept your problem and work on it. Whether you are the best horse or the worst, or whether your posture is good or bad is out of the question. Everyone can practice Zazen, and in this way work on his problems and accept them. When you are sitting in the middle of your own problem, which is more real to you, your problem or you yourself? The awareness that you are here right now is the ultimate fact. This is the point you will realize by Zazen practice. In continuous practice, under a succession of agreeable and disagreeable situations, you will realize the marrow of Zen and acquire its true strength, bowing. After Zazen, we bow to the floor nine times. By bowing, we are giving up ourselves. To give up ourselves means to give up our dualistic ideas. So there is no difference between Zazen practice and bowing. Usually to bow means to pay our respects to something which is more worthy of respect than ourselves. But when you bow to Buddha, you should have no idea of Buddha. You just become one with Buddha. You are already Buddha himself. When you become one with Buddha, one with everything that exists, you find the true meaning of being. When you forget all your dualistic ideas, everything becomes your teacher, and everything can be the object of worship. When everything exists within your big mind, all dualistic relationships drop away. There is no distinction between heaven and earth, man and woman, teacher and disciple. Sometimes a man bows to a woman. Sometimes a woman bows to a man. Sometimes the disciple bows to the master. Sometimes the master bows to the disciple. A master who cannot bow to his disciple cannot bow to Buddha. Sometimes the master and disciple bow together to Buddha. Sometimes we may bow to cats and dogs. In your big mind, everything has the same value. Everything is Buddha himself. You see something or hear a sound, and there you have everything, just as it is. In your practice, you should accept everything as it is, giving to each thing the same respect given to a Buddha. Here there is Buddhahood. Then Buddha bows to Buddha, and you bow to yourself. This is the true bow. If you do not have this firm conviction of big mind in your practice, your bow will be dualistic. When you are just yourself, you bow to yourself in its true sense, and you are one with everything. Only when you are you yourself can you bow to everything in its true sense. Bowing is a very serious practice. You should be prepared to bow even in your last moment. When you cannot do anything except bow, you should do it. This kind of conviction is necessary. Bow with this spirit, and all the precepts, all the teachings are yours, and you will possess everything within your big mind. Sen no Rikyu, the founder of the Japanese tea ceremony, committed harakiri, ritual suicide by disembowelment in 1591 at the order of his lord Hideyoshi. Just before Rikyu took his own life, he said, When I have this sword, there is no Buddha and no patriarchs. He meant that when we have the sword of big mind, there is no dualistic world. The only thing which exists is this spirit. This kind of imperturbable spirit was always present in Rikyu's tea ceremony. He never did anything in just a dualistic way. He was ready to die in each moment. In ceremony after ceremony, he died, 
and he renewed himself. This is the spirit of the tea ceremony. This is how we bow. My teacher had a callus on his forehead from bowing. He knew he was an obstinate, stubborn fellow, and so he bowed and bowed and bowed. The reason he bowed was that inside himself he always heard his master's scolding voice. He had joined the Soto order when he was thirty, which for a Japanese priest is rather late. When we are young we are less stubborn, and it is easier to get rid of our selfishness. So his master always called my teacher, you lately joined fellow, and scolded him for joining so late. Actually his master loved him for his stubborn character. When my teacher was seventy, he said, When I was young, I was like a tiger. But now, I am like a cat. He was very pleased to be like a cat. Bowing helps to eliminate our self-centered ideas. This is not so easy. It is difficult to get rid of these ideas, and bowing is a very valuable practice. The result is not the point. It is the effort to improve ourselves that is valuable. There is no end to this practice. Each bow expresses one of the four Buddhist vows. These vows are, although sentient beings are innumerable, we vow to save them. Although our evil desires are limitless, we vow to be rid of them. Although the teaching is limitless, we vow to learn it all. Although Buddhism is unattainable, we vow to attain it. If it is unattainable, how can we attain it? But we should. That is Buddhism. To think, because it is possible we will do it, is not Buddhism. Even though it is impossible, we have to do it because our true nature wants us to. But actually, whether or not it is possible is not the point. If it is our inmost desire to get rid of our self-centered ideas, we have to do it. When we make this effort, our inmost desire is appeased and nirvana is there. Before you determine to do it, you have difficulty. If you keep your original mind, the precepts will keep themselves. In the beginner's mind there is no thought, I have attained something. All self-centered thoughts limit our vast mind. When we have no thought of achievement, no thought of self, we are true beginners. Then we can really learn something. The beginner's mind is the mind of compassion. When our mind is compassionate, it is boundless. Dogen Zenji, the founder of our school, always emphasized how important it is to resume our boundless original mind then we are always true to ourselves, in sympathy with all beings, and can actually practice. So the most difficult thing is always to keep your beginner's mind. There is no need to have a deep understanding of Zen. Even though you read much Zen literature, you must read each sentence with a fresh mind. You should not say, I know what Zen is, or I have attained enlightenment. This is also the real secret of the arts. Always be a beginner. Be very, very careful about this point. If you start to practice Zazen, you will begin to appreciate your beginner's mind. It is the secret of Zen practice. Right practice. Posture. Now I would like to talk about our Zazen posture. When you sit in the full lotus position, your left foot is on your right thigh, and your right foot is on your left thigh. When we cross our legs like this, even though we have a right leg and a left leg, they have become one. The position expresses the oneness of duality, not two and not one. This is the most important teaching, not two and not one. Our body and mind are not two and not one. If you think your body and mind are two, that is wrong. If you think that they are one, that is also wrong. 
our body and mind are both two and one. We usually think that if something is not one, it is more than one. If it is not singular, it is plural, but in actual experience, our life is not only plural, but also singular. Each one of us is both dependent and independent. After some years, we will die. If we just think that it is the end of our life, this will be the wrong understanding. But on the other hand, if we think that we do not die, this is also wrong. We die and we do not die. This is the right understanding. Some people may say that our mind or soul exists forever, and it is only our physical body which dies. But this is not exactly right, because both mind and body have their end. But at the same time, it is also true that they exist eternally. And even though we say mind and body, they are actually two sides of one coin. This is the right understanding. So when we take this posture, it symbolizes this truth. When I have the left foot on the right side of my body and the right foot on the left side of my body, I do not know which is which. So either may be the left or the right side. The most important thing in taking the Zazen posture is to keep your spine straight. Your ears and your shoulders should be on one line. Relax your shoulders and push up toward the ceiling with the back of your head and you should pull your chin in. When your chin is tilted up, you have no strength in your posture. You are probably dreaming. Also, to gain strength in your posture, press your diaphragm down toward your hara, or lower abdomen. This will help you maintain your physical and mental balance. When you try to keep this posture, at first you may find some difficulty breathing naturally, but when you get accustomed to it, you will be able to breathe naturally and deeply. Your hand should form the cosmic mudra. If you put your left hand on top of your right, middle joints of your middle fingers together, and touch your thumbs lightly together, as if you held a piece of paper between them, your hands will make a beautiful oval. You should keep this universal mudra with great care, as if you were holding something very precious in your hand. Your hand should be held against your body, with your thumbs at about the height of your navel. Hold your arms freely and easily and slightly away from your body as if you held an egg under each arm without breaking it. You should not be tilted sideways, backwards or forwards. You should be sitting straight up as if you were supporting the sky with your head. This is not just form or breathing. It expresses the key point of Buddhism. It is a perfect expression of your Buddha nature. If you want true understanding of Buddhism, you should practice this way. These forms are not a means of obtaining the right state of mind. To take this posture itself is the purpose of our practice. When you have this posture, you have the right state of mind, so there's no need to try to attain some special state. When you try to attain something, your mind starts to wander about somewhere else. When you do not try to attain anything, you have your own body and mind right here. A Zen master would say, kill the Buddha. Kill the Buddha if the Buddha exists somewhere else. Kill the Buddha because you should resume your own Buddha nature. Doing something is expressing your own nature. We do not exist for the sake of something else. We exist for the sake of ourselves. This is the fundamental teaching expressed in the forms we observe. Just as for sitting, when we stand in the Zendo, we have some rules. But the purpose of these rules is not to make everyone the same, but to allow each to express his own self most freely. For instance, each one of us has his own way of standing. So our standing posture is based on the proportions of our own bodies. When you stand, your heels should be as far apart as the width of your own fist. Your big toes in line with the centers of your breasts. As in Zazen, put some strength in your abdomen. Here also your hands should express yourself. 
Hold your left hand against your chest with fingers encircling your thumb and put your right hand over it. Holding your thumb pointing downward and your forearms parallel to the floor, you feel as if you have some round pillar in your grasp, a big round temple pillar, so you cannot be slumped or tilted to the side. The most important point is to own your own physical body. If you slump, you will lose yourself. Your mind will be wandering about somewhere else. You will not be in your body. This is not the way. We must exist right here, right now. This is the key point. You must have your own body in mind. Everything should exist in the right place in the right way. Then there is no problem. If the microphone I use when I speak exists somewhere else, it will not serve its purpose. When we have our body and mind in order, everything else will exist in the right place, in the right way. But usually without being aware of it, we try to change something other than ourselves. We try to order things outside us. But it is impossible to organize things if you yourself are not in order. When you do things in the right way, at the right time, everything else will be organized. You are the boss. When the boss is sleeping, everyone is sleeping. When the boss does something right, everyone will do everything right and at the right time. That is the secret of Buddhism. So try always to keep the right posture, not only when you practice Zazen, but in all your activities. Take the right posture when you are driving your car and when you are reading. If you read in a slumped position, you cannot stay awake long. Try. You will discover how important it is to keep the right posture. This is the true teaching. The teaching which is written on paper is not the true teaching. Written teaching is a kind of food for your brain. Of course, it's necessary to take some food for your brain, but it is more important to be yourself by practicing the right way of life. That is why Buddha could not accept the religions existing at his time. He studied many religions, but he was not satisfied with their practices. He could not find the answer in asceticism or in philosophies. He was not interested in some metaphysical existence, but in his own body and mind, here and now. And when he found himself, he found that everything that exists has Buddha nature. That was his enlightenment. Enlightenment is not some good feeling or some particular state of mind. The state of mind that exists when you sit in the right posture is itself enlightenment. If you cannot be satisfied with the state of mind you have in Zazen, it means your mind is still wandering about. Our body and mind should not be wobbling or wandering about. In this posture, there's no need to talk about the right state of mind. You already have it. This is the conclusion of Buddhism. Strictly speaking, any effort we make is not good for our practice because it creates waves in our mind. It is impossible, however, to attain absolute calmness of our mind without any effort. We must make some effort, but we must forget ourselves in the effort we make. In this realm, there's no subjectivity or objectivity. Our mind is just calm, without even any awareness. In this unawareness, every effort and every idea and thought will vanish. So it is necessary for us to encourage ourselves and to make an effort up to the last moment when all effort disappears. You should keep your mind on your breathing until you are not aware of your breathing. We should try to continue our effort forever, but we should not expect to reach some stage when we will forget all about it. We should just try to keep our mind on our breathing. That is our actual practice. That effort will be refined more and more while you are sitting. At first, the effort you make is quite rough and impure, but by the power of practice, the effort will become purer and purer. 
When your effort becomes pure, your body and mind become pure. This is the way we practice Zen. Once you understand our innate power to purify ourselves and our surroundings, you can act properly and you will learn from those around you and you will become friendly with others. This is the merit of Zen practice. But the way of practice is just to be concentrated on your breathing with the right posture and with great, pure effort. This is how we practice Zen, the marrow of Zen. In our scriptures, Samyukta Gama Sutra, Volume 33, it is said that there are four kinds of horses, excellent ones, good ones, poor ones, and bad ones. The best horse will run slow and fast, right and left at the driver's will before it sees the shadow of the whip. The second best will run as well as the first one does just before the whip reaches its skin. The third one will run when it feels pain on its body. The fourth will run after the pain penetrates to the marrow of its bones. You can imagine how difficult it is for the fourth one to learn how to run. When we hear this story, almost all of us want to be the best horse. If it is impossible to be the best one, we want to be the second best. This is, I think, the usual understanding of this story and of Zen. You may think that when you sit in Zazen, you will find out whether you are one of the best horses or one of the worst ones. Here, however, there is a misunderstanding of Zen. If you think the aim of Zen practice is to train you to become one of the best horses, you will have a big problem. This is not the right understanding. If you practice Zen in the right way, it does not matter whether you are the best horse or the worst one. When you consider the mercy of Buddha, how do you think Buddha will feel about the four kinds of horses? He will have more sympathy for the worst one than for the best one. When you are determined to practice Zazen with the great mind of Buddha, you will find the worst horse is the most valuable one. In your very imperfections, you will find the basis for your firm, way-seeking mind. Those who can sit perfectly physically usually take more time to obtain the true way of Zen, the actual feeling of Zen, the marrow of Zen. But those who find great difficulties in practicing Zen will find more meaning in it. So I think that sometimes the best horse may be the worst horse, and the worst horse can be the best one. If you study calligraphy, you will find that those who are not so clever usually become the best calligraphers. Those who are very clever with their hands often encounter great difficulty after they have reached a certain stage. This is also true in art and in Zen. It is true in life. So when we talk about Zen, we cannot say, he is good or he is bad in the ordinary sense of the words. The posture taken in Zazen is not the same for each of us. For some it may be impossible to take the cross-legged posture. But even though you cannot take the right posture, when you arouse your real way-seeking mind, you can practice Zen in its true sense. Actually, it is easier for those who have difficulties in sitting to arouse the true way-seeking mind than for those who can sit easily. When we reflect on what we are doing in our everyday life, we are always ashamed of ourselves. One of my students wrote to me saying, you sent me a calendar and I'm trying to follow the good mottos which appear on each page. But the year has hardly begun and already I have failed. Dogen Zenji said, Shushaku Jushaku. Shaku generally means mistake or wrong. Shushaku Jushaku means to succeed wrong with wrong or one continuous mistake. According to Dogen, one continuous mistake can also be Zen. 
a Zen master's life could be said to be so many years of Shoshaku Jushaku. This means so many years of one single-minded effort. We say a good father is not a good father. Do you understand? One who thinks he is a good father is not a good father. One who thinks he is a good husband is not a good husband. One who thinks he is one of the worst husbands may be a good one if he is always trying to be a good husband with a single-hearted effort. If you find it impossible to sit because of some pain or some physical difficulty, then you should sit anyway, using a thick cushion or a chair. Even though you are the worst horse, you will get to the marrow of Zen. Breathing when we practice Sazen, our mind always follows our breathing. When we inhale, the air comes into the inner world. When we exhale, the air goes out to the outer world. The inner world is limitless, and the outer world is also limitless. We say inner world or outer world, but actually there is just one whole world. In this limitless world, our throat is like a swinging door. The air comes in and goes out like someone passing through a swinging door. If you think, I breathe, the I is extra. There is no you to say I. What we call I is just a swinging door, which moves when we inhale and when we exhale. It just moves, that's all. When your mind is pure and calm enough to follow this movement, there's nothing. No I, no world, no mind, no body, just a swinging door. So when we practice Zazen, all that exists is the movement of the breathing, but we're aware of this movement. You should not be absent-minded. But to be aware of the movement does not mean to be aware of your small self, but rather of your universal nature or Buddha nature. This kind of awareness is very important because we are usually so one-sided. Our usual understanding of life is dualistic. You and I, this and that, good and bad. But actually, these discriminations are themselves the awareness of the universal existence. You means to be aware of the universe in the form of you. And I means to be aware of it in the form of I. You and I are just swinging doors. This kind of understanding is necessary. This should not even be called understanding. It is actually the true experience of life through Zen practice. So when you practice Zazen, there's no idea of time or space. You may say we started sitting at a quarter to six in this room. Thus you have some idea of time, a quarter to six and some idea of space in this room. Actually, what you are doing, however, is just sitting and being aware of the universal activity. That is all. This moment, the swinging door is opening in one direction, and the next moment, the swinging door will be opening in the opposite direction. Moment after moment, each one of us repeats this activity. Here, there is no idea of time or space. Time and space are one. You may say, I must do something this afternoon. But actually, there's no this afternoon. We do things one after the other, that's all. There is no such time as this afternoon, or one o'clock, or two o'clock. At one o'clock, you will eat your lunch. To eat lunch is itself one o'clock. You will be somewhere. But that place cannot be separated from one o'clock. For someone who actually appreciates our life, they're the same. But when we become tired of our life, we may say, I shouldn't have come to this place. It may have been much better to have gone to some other place for lunch. This place is not so good. In your mind, you create an idea of place separate from an actual time. Or you may say, this is bad, so I should not do this. Actually, when you say, I should not do this, you are doing not doing in that moment. So there's no choice for you. 
When you separate the idea of time and space, you feel as if you have some choice. But actually, you have to do something, or you have to do not doing. Not to do something is doing something. Good and bad are only in your mind. So we should not say, this is good or this is bad. Instead of saying bad, you should say, not to do. If you think this is bad, it will create some confusion for you. So in the realm of pure religion, there is no confusion of time and space or good or bad. All that we should do is just do something as it comes. Do something. Whatever it is, we should do it, even if it is not doing something. We should live in this moment. So when we sit, we concentrate on our breathing, and we become a swinging door, and we do something we should do, something we must do. This is Zen practice. In this practice, there's no confusion. If you establish this kind of life, you have no confusion whatsoever. Tozan, a famous Zen master, said, The blue mountain is the father of the white cloud. The white cloud is the son of the blue mountain. All day long they depend on each other, without being dependent on each other. The white cloud is always the white cloud. The blue mountain is always the blue mountain. This is a pure, clear interpretation of life. There may be many things like the white cloud and blue mountain. Man and woman, teacher and disciple. They depend on each other. But the white cloud should not be bothered by the blue mountain. The blue mountain should not be bothered by the white cloud. They're quite independent, but yet dependent. This is how we live and how we practice Sazen. When we become truly ourselves, we just become a swinging door, and we are purely independent of, and at the same time, dependent upon everything. Without air, we cannot breathe. Each one of us is in the midst of myriads of worlds. We are in the center of the world always, moment after moment. So we are completely dependent and independent. If you have this kind of experience, this kind of existence, you have absolute independence. You will not be bothered by anything. So when you practice Zazen, your mind should be concentrated on your breathing. This kind of activity is the fundamental activity of the universal being. Without this experience, this practice, it is impossible to attain absolute freedom. Control. To live in the realm of Buddha nature means to die as a small being, moment after moment. When we lose our balance, we die. But at the same time, we also develop ourselves. We grow. Whatever we see is changing, losing its balance. Part 2. Right Attitude Single-Minded Way The purpose of my talk is not to give you some intellectual understanding, but just to express my appreciation of our Zen practice. To be able to sit with you in Zazen is very, very unusual. Of course, whatever we do is unusual because our life itself is so unusual. Buddha said, to appreciate your human life is as rare as soil on your fingernail. You know dirt hardly ever sticks on your nail. Our human life is rare and wonderful. When I sit, I want to remain sitting forever. But I encourage myself to have another practice. For instance, to recite the sutra or to bow. And when I bow, I think, this is wonderful. But I have to change my practice again to recite the sutra. So the purpose of my talk is to express my appreciation. That is all. Our way is not to sit to acquire something. It is to express our true nature. That is our practice. If you want to express yourself, your true nature, there should be some natural and appropriate way of expression. Even swaying right and left as you sit down or get up from Zazen is an expression of yourself. It is not preparation for practice or relaxation after practice. It is part of the practice. So we should not do it as if it were preparing for something else. 
This should be true in your everyday life. To cook or to fix some food is not preparation. According to Dogen, it is practice. To cook is not just to prepare food for someone or for yourself. It is to express your sincerity. So when you cook, you should express yourself in your activity in the kitchen. You should allow yourself plenty of time. You should work on it with nothing in your mind and without expecting anything. You should just cook. That is also an expression of our sincerity, a part of our practice. It is necessary to sit in Zazen in this way. But sitting is not our only way. Whatever you do, it should be an expression of the same deep activity. We should appreciate what we are doing. There is no preparation for something else. The Bodhisattva's way is called the single-minded way, or one railway track thousands of miles long. The railway track is always the same. If it were to become wider or narrower, it would be disastrous. Wherever you go, the railway track is always the same. That is the Bodhisattva's way. So even if the sun were to rise from the west, the Bodhisattva has only one way. His way is in each moment to express his nature and his sincerity. We say railway track, but actually there's no such thing. Sincerity itself is the railway track. The sights we see from the train will change, but we're always running on the same track, and there's no beginning or end to the track. Beginningless and endless track. There's no starting point, nor goal, nothing to attain. Just to run on the track is our way. This is the nature of our Zen practice. But when you become curious about the railway track, danger is there. You should not see the railway track. If you look at the track, you'll become dizzy. Just appreciate the sights you see from the train. That's our way. There is no need for the passengers to be curious about the track. Someone will take care of it. Buddha will take care of it. But sometimes we try to explain the railway track because we become curious if something is always the same. We wonder, how is it possible for the Bodhisattva always to be the same? What is his secret? But there is no secret. Everyone has the same nature as the railway track. There were two good friends, Chokai and Hofuku. They were talking about the Bodhisattva's way and Chokai said, even if the Arhat, an enlightened one, were to have evil desires, still the Tathagata Buddha does not have two kinds of words. I say that the Tathagata has words, but no dualistic words. Hofuku said, even though you say so, your comment is not perfect. Choke asked, what is your understanding of the Tathagata's words? Hofuku said, we have had enough discussion, so let's have a cup of tea. Hofuku did not give his friend an answer, because it is impossible to give a verbal interpretation of our way. Nevertheless, as a part of their practice, these two good friends discussed the Bodhisattva's way, even though they did not expect to find a new interpretation. So Hofuku answered, our discussion is over. Let's have a cup of tea. That's a very good answer, isn't it? It's the same for my talk. When my talk is over, your listening is over. There's no need to remember what I say. There's no need to understand what I say. You understand. You have full understanding within yourself. There is no problem. Repetition. The Indian thought and practice encountered by Buddha was based on an idea of human beings as a combination of spiritual and physical elements. They thought that the physical side of man bound the spiritual side, and so their religious practice was aimed at making the physical element weaker in order to free and strengthen the spirit. Thus the practice Buddha found in India emphasized asceticism. But Buddha found when he practiced asceticism that there was no limit to the attempt to purge ourselves physically, and that it made religious practice very idealistic. And this kind of war with our body can only end when we die. But according to this Indian thought, we will return in another life, and another life, 
to repeat the struggle over and over again without ever attaining perfect enlightenment. And even if you think you can make your physical strength weak enough to free your spiritual power, it will only work as long as you continue your ascetic practice. If you resume your everyday life, you will have to strengthen your body, but then you'll have to weaken it again to regain your spiritual power. And then you'll have to repeat this process over and over again. This may be too great a simplification of the Indian practice encountered by Buddha, and we may laugh at it. But actually, some people continue this practice even today. Sometimes without realizing it, this idea of asceticism is in the back of their minds. But practicing in this way will not result in any progress.